poetry is said to be the language of the soul, the expression of lofty and noble thoughts in appropriate language. Regardless of the lofty thoughts or the appropriate language, the reciter or reader of poetry uh, must be capable of expressing the emotions and the thoughts of the poet. Our own Dr. Webster is most competent to do this. He has had a long experience in this field, having been at Kansas State University, Ohio State University in the speech department, and has traveled widely presenting po uh, programs of poetry. It is our very great pleasure to present Dr. Webster. Thank you very much, Madam President. I'd better get that in. <laughs> you know what's good for you. Yes. <laughs> of members and members. I'm starting very, very slowly. Please understand, I must. I have to find out if I'm able to carry the load as I go along. <clears throat> it's a pleasure, certainly, to be in a speaking situation again. It seems quite a while since I have been able to stand before a group and to express my opinions, whether they meet with other approval or not. Uh, in asking what I was to do tonight, uh, several of the ladies were quite candid. They say, do your thing, and if possible, be a little funny. Now this business of being funny, I've encountered the problem before. Uh, Always there are two questions about being funny. The first is, what is humor? What is funny? And the second is, what is acceptable humor? As a teacher of speech for a great many years, always I would teach, as we should, that a person in a speaking situation has no right ever to embarrass any individual before him by employing the wrong kind of humor. It's a problem. I recognized it at an early date. I was teaching at Kent State University, as was mentioned. What year this was, I won't say, but it was before the war, World War II. Uh, before class started, one of my students in a speech class, fully aware of how I felt about this sort of thing, said, uh, <coughs> Webster, I have a story I want to tell. I want to check it with you, very thoughtful of him. And the story, very briefly, was a lady visiting somewhere else in the country made a long-distance phone call. When it was terminated, she called the operator to find how much it was and found she owed seven dollars and a quarter. And she blew her top. And in no uncertain terms, told the operator that back home where she lived, she could call Ellen back for seven dollars and a quarter. And the operator, who was very much on the ball, observed that probably where she lived was a local call. <laughs> All right, this is the story. I reacted as I think you would have. This is very funny. Nothing wrong with this. Go ahead. So I called upon him as the first speaker. He told the story. He relaxed. I relaxed. Everybody relaxed. And all at once, I quit relaxing. He was in the second story. The word hell did not appear in the second story. But a telephone call did. The phone rang in the Salvation Army office. They answered, and the voice said, Is this Salvation Army? Yes. Do you, do you save people there? Yes. Do you save, do you save women? Yes. Did you save bad women? Well, we try to. Well, save two for me for Saturday night. I got a friend coming over. <laughs> I like, after all these years, these show help me happen this way. I like to remember these two because they taught me a lesson and I've remembered it all through the years. So that followed the second story was not in question. There was a word hell and appeared in the first, so there was a bit of a question. So what constitutes good and bad humor is in the mind of the speaker, and sometimes you can get out of order, I assure you I will not. Very simply in looking at humor, and this again is a part where I'm not doing my thing. You know, I'm just uh, moseying along. What do I laugh at? Well, let's, I'll oversimplify. We laugh at two or three things. One thing we laugh at is the sudden surprise, the grotesque, 
the unexpected. Several weeks ago, I remember hearing of oyster fisheries up the East Coast. And they got an oyster so large that it took two men to swallow it. <laughs> now, do you want me to start this again? There was an oyster. <laughs> the sudden, the unexpected, the grotesque, the utterly ridiculous. The man who turned in such high expense accounts, so much money spent here and there. And an auditor had gone over his accounts and called him in. Indignant. He says, how in the hell can a man spend $22 for eating in one day? And the fellow said, I skip breakfast. <laughs> You're not expecting this. You turn it. I I've loved the story for a long time. A story of two sisters, oh, somewhere in their 50s, living on an income not very, very high, enough for them barely to get along. But they both had dentures, and they could only afford one set between them. <laughs> so they had to slip the dentures back and forth, particularly where social events were concerned. One day they were invited to a tea given by the dean of a nearby college. They were excited about this. So Mary got ready. They drew lots. She drew the first hour and a half. The tea was from 2 to 5, so she drew the 2 to 3.30 time. She got all dressed in, plopped in her teeth, and went to the tea. Of course, Martha was all ready for her at 3.30. So as Martha came in the door, or as Mary came in the door, here was Martha with her hand out. She got the teeth, plopped them in, started out the door, stopped, smiled slightly, and turned and said, hmm, macaroons. <laughs> I love the story, and I've always said that it's one of the dirtiest clean stories I've ever known. But it is sudden, you never know what's coming, the grotesque, the unexpected. What do we laugh at? Well, besides the, the unexpected, the new, the grotesque, we laugh in this country at the mind that is under the influence. It's not just so much that we laugh at the drunk. We laugh at the mind trying so hard to be serious in a non-serious mental condition. And so we laugh at the intoxicated man. I, I, I like to recall the fellow who walked into an open elevator shaft, fell two stories, picked himself up mumbling and said, I said up. <laughs> now he was trying to say the right thing. But this was the intoxicated mind, unable to do so at that time. Also, the fellow coming in late at night, carrying his shoes. Didn't want to bother, didn't want to awaken his wife. She heard the noise and called down, is that you, John? And he says, well, by God, it had better be. <laughs> Good, serious thinking, a little bit in the wrong direction. And then, well, this fellow was coming home at night. He saw a grasshopper in front of him. He stooped down and said, Oh, grasshopper, did you know that a drink was named after you? The grasshopper looked up and says, A drink named Herman? <laughs> I, I sneaked that in. I don't know what it is. We can't, we can't consider the intoxicated stories without thinking of the marvelous situation of the intoxicated mind driving the wrong way on a one-way street. And the cop says, where do you think you're going? And he says, I don't know, but I'm late because everybody's coming back. <laughs> or maybe the cop said, didn't you see the arrows? And he said, I didn't even see the end then. <laughs> so we like it. It's a sudden, it's the unexpected, but it's also the mind trying to perform in a serious manner. All right, we'll have the grotesque. We laugh at the intoxicated mind, and we laugh at language. Now, I'm referring to a certain aspect of language because it's uh, been a sort of a favorite topic of mine for a great many years. We laugh at the pun so much more than we realize. Some time ago, somebody, and I very carefully don't know who it was, who who started the saying, pun is the lowest form of humor. 
if we remove the pun from our humor in this country, I think we would remove at least half of our humor. So many times we don't stop to think at all. We simply will agree, yes, a pun, yeah, a pun. We have a noise that goes with it. Yeah, yeah, oh, no, not that, that type of thing. Now we have basically, and this of course is oversimplification, basically two kinds of puns. The contrived pun and the natural pun. The contrived is carefully planned, built up. And we can admire its structure, and we can admire the writing of it, we can admire the person practicing enough to be able to say it. But then we have, and this is more to the point, the natural pun, at which we start to laugh before we start to figure. And then we never carry it far enough to think that this might have been a pun. So the two young rabbits got lost in the woods, had a hair-raising experience. <laughs> Is all right if I stop with it. <laughs> this is the this is the natural pun. We laugh at the situation without analyzing and saying to ourselves, "This is a pun." So we have the the, the case of well, there's a young fellow who is very down in the mouth, a high school boy. Miss Fred said, "What's the matter?" He says, "My girl, what what about it?" She said she'd be true to the end. Well, that sounds good. I'm a tackle. <laughs> Here is the essence of the pun. But we don't stop to think this is a pun. The laughter comes first. Now, along with this, we have the contrived pun. Build up very carefully. The umpire, who was a brute, he treated all members of the, of the baseball teams for the umpire. Uh, as, uh, as if they were beneath his feet. He was unkind to them. He was a bore. He was gross. He treated his wife always the same way. He had trouble with his boy because of the way he treated him. And then one day he decided to turn over a new leaf. He umpired a game and did it beautifully. He wasn't a brute in this game. He took a present home to his wife. He kissed her. He tried to make up to the boy. He tried to get the boy to sit on his knee. But we know that the boy wouldn't do that because we know that the son never sits on the brutish jump iron. Mm. <laughs> Hear the noise? Uh, Hear the noise? Uh, all right. this, is, this is tradition. We have built up this reaction. But it's a careful planning, and there's a great amount of enjoyment, I think, in the experiencing, in, in the saying it, in the practicing and being able to. But we mustn't forget that we have the little, the little short stories. I can tell you a way to make money in a hurry. Find enough money to buy a hundred female pigs and a hundred male deer. And just like that, you've got two hundred thousand bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't this ridiculous? And yet we're likely to laugh at this before we stop to think. Old soldiers never die, we know this, but old gardeners never die, they just fade away. <laughs> and we can get some pleasure from that. Old fishermen never die, they just smell that way. <laughs> and we can get some pleasure from this. The natural and the contrived, the man who walked along the beach throwing stones at the little terns that were flying around. Very, very complete, very serious about this. He left no turn on stone. <laughs> not such a bad noise. The noise was over here, but not so bad. <laughs> then I had a friend, Ben. Ben Opper Nockety. I know, a weird name. Ben Opper Nockety. He was a piano teller. One day he tuned a piano for a man. The man didn't think he had done a good job said he should do it again, and Ben wouldn't do it. He says, Opera knock it, he tunes but one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's one you practice on. You have to practice. <laughs> so we have this is the plan. And I've got to finish this up someday. <laughs> this is the plan. Uh, we have the case over under Nesso Station. I forget just where it was. It was in Cocoa. 
where a swarm of bees had collected on the edge of their building. So they called a vet that told him to come over to this address. He said he'd get the swarm. But he pulled up, looked at the sign, wouldn't get out of the car. He said, there are so bees. <laughs> <laughs> now this we can laugh at. We don't have to worry about any details. <laughs> All right. I have breathlessly, and with a lot of hard work, tried to be funny. <laughs> that is part of it. Now, doing the thing is another thing entirely. And maybe as I go along into it, I can relax enough <clears throat> to bring the breathing back to a level. <clears throat> the other thing has to do with this word poetry. For some time, for a good many years, if I've had any mission at all in making speeches, it has been to try to show that the word poetry is not a bad word, just as I was trying in a much smaller way to show that the word pun is not a bad word. But it's a serious situation in this country. Generations have grown up to associate the word poetry, poetry stinks, I hate poetry simply because of the word. They don't stop to realize, they don't stop to think of experiences they've had where poetry can fascinate them and hold them. But the word itself you must not use. So in some years when I was on the road, high school and college assemblies, trying to sell poetry on a title so you don't like poetry, I would have that in the title, but from then on I would scarcely use the word again. I would use the one once upon a time principle, the picture painting principle. The end of the selection before they were, had a chance to build up an objection to the word poetry. And I want to bring a little something from two writers who do not appear in the textbooks, but who have bought, brought a great amount of pleasure, deep pleasure to millions of people throughout the world. One, a native-born Canadian, Robert W. Service. Now, Robert Service wrote about the shooting of Dad McGree, McGrew and the spell of the Yukon and the Parson's son and a bunch of stories. Everything he told in verse, he told well as a story. I want to bring one of the stories also well known, particularly where the men present are concerned. There are strange things <coughs> done neath the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake Labarge. I cremated Sam McGee. Oh. Now Sam McGee was from Tennessee where the cotton blooms and blows. Why he left his home in the south to roam round the pole, God only knows. He was always cold, but the land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell, though he'd often say in his homely way that he'd sooner be in hell. Well, one Christmas day, we was mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold. Through the parka fold it stabbed like a driven nail. If our eyes we'd closed, then our lasses froze. Sometimes we couldn't see. It wasn't much fun. But the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. And that very night, as we lay packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, and the dogs were fed and and the stars overhead were dancing, heel and toe, he turned to me. Cap, says he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess. And if I do, I'm asking that you won't refuse my last request. Well, he seemed so low, I couldn't say no. Then, then he said with a sort of a moan, it's the barsted cold. And it's got right hold till I'm chilled clean through to the bone. Oh, it ain't being dead. It's the awful dread of the icy grave that pains. So I want you to swear that, foul or fair, you'll cremate my last remains. Well, a man's last need is a thing to heed. 
and I swore that I wouldn't fail. And we started on at the break of dawn, but oh, he was ghastly pale. He was crouched on the sleigh, and he raved all day of his home in Tennessee, and before nightfall, the corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in that land of death. As I hurried, horror-driven, with a corpse half hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise given. It was lashed in the sleigh, and it seemed to say, go on, tax your brawn and your brains, but your promise true, and it's up to you to cremate my last remains. Well, a promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail has its own stern coat. In the days to come, though, my lips were dumb in my heart how I cursed that load. In the long, long night, by the lone firelight, when the huskies round in a ring howled out their woes to the homeless snows, oh, God, how I loathed the thing. And every day, that quiet clay seemed heavier to grow. But on I went, though the dogs were spent and the grub was getting low, the trail was bad, and I felt half mad. But I swore that I'd not give in. And I used to sing to the hateful thing. And it hearkened with a grin. Till I came to the marge of Lake LaBarge. And a derelict there lay jammed in the ice. Oh. And I saw in a trice it was called the Alice May. And I, I looked at it and I thought a bit. And I looked at my frozen chum. And here, said I with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. Some planks I tore from the cabin floor and, and I lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found that was lying around and I heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared, the furnace roared. Such a flame you seldom see. Then I burrowed a hole in the glowing coal and I stuffed in Sam McGee. Then I took a hike for I didn't like to hear him sizzle so. And the heavens scowled, and the huskies howled, and the wind began to blow. It was deathly cold. But the hot sweat rolled down my face, and I don't know why. And the greasy smoke in an inky cloak went streaking down the sky. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with grisly fear. But the stars came out, and they danced about here again, I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I best take a look inside. I suppose it's cooked and it's time I looked. And the door I opened wide, and there sat Sam, looking cool and calm in the heart of the furnace roar. And he wore a smile you could see a mile. And he said, please close the door. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine in here. But I greatly fear you'll let in the rain and the storm. Since I left Plum Tree down in Tennessee, it's the first time I've been warm. <laughs> there are strange things done beneath the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. And the Arctic trails have their secret tales that make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge when I cremated Sam McGee. That's poetry. Quite frankly, uh, am, am I acceptable with all of this squeezing and gasping? Yeah. Well, I'm not after sympathy. I, uh, I don't want you to have to take it. 
if it's an effort, because it's sure as hell an effort for me to give. <laughs> Yeah, but I'll... Can you cut it? Yeah, I'll cut it. I think that's what I should, and I'm just taking a little breather right now. There was another name that I mentioned. Also a, a maker of poetry who does not appear in the textbooks. I don't know. No, I don't think that's his name is Robert, is, is Donald Blanding, B-L-A-N-D-I-N-G. Not Mr. Blanding's dream house, no. Donald Blanding, a man a few years older than I, born in Lawton, Oklahoma, spent early years, many of them in Hawaii, uh, traveled the world consistently and continuously. About 15 years ago, was living in Florida. I'm ashamed. Lost track entirely. I've been trying for two weeks with two libraries. I cannot locate whether he's living or dead and if living where. Don Blanding was a fellow who wrote not so much storytelling poetry as picture painting poetry. And always a sense for humor. He had been publishing some material for several years. I was still too young to be very much interested in it. And then one day I read somewhere, I know there are onions in heaven, for they have a heavenly smell. A smell like the smile of a long lost friend who has good news to tell. Roses are lovely and fragrant, but whoever tasted them fried. And lilies are fine to lay on the breast of one who has lately died. But onions, aroma, immortal, that smother a steak done well. I know there are onions in heaven, for they have a heavenly smell. A simple little thing, six or eight lines. But here's a fellow who had a pretty good sense of humor. I noticed the name Donald Blanding, and that was it. Fortunately, just a few months later, I came across the lively little bumptious flea I do not like, but it likes me. It crawls about upon my pelt and leaves its flaming telltale welt. But when with murderous intent I seek the flea, the flea has went. <laughs> Life's greatest mystery to me is why God made the blasted flea. How can a flea adore its mate? And that it must, they propagate. <laughs> and this had also the same name, Donald Blanding. And then a little later I came across something which showed that he could see under the surface. We saw a firefly float through the night, glimmering fitfully, trailing its light like a vagabond star. Oh, catch it, you cried. I caught it and sought it. You took it and sighed as you looked at its dim, dying light, faint and pale. Why, it's only a bug with a light in its tail. We had a moment, exquisitely bright. It dazzled our hearts with its splintered starlight. You said, let us catch it and hold it. I sighed and remembered the night that the firefly died and wondered how long it would be till you'd wail. It's only a bug with a light in its tail. And that sold me on the guy. So I looked him up. I found some material he had done. I am eternally thankful for him for, if for no other reason, one selection alone, the cutting of which I wish to finish with tonight. West of the sunset stands my house. There, and east of the dawn, North to the Arctic runs my yard, south to the pole my lawn. Seven seas are to sail my ships to the ends of the earth. Beyond, drifter's gold is mine to spend, for I am a vagabond. Fabulous cities are mine to loot, queens of the world to wed, fruits of the earth are mine to keep. The couch of a king, my bed. All that I see is mine to keep. 
foolish the fancy seems, but I am rich with the wealth of sight, the coin of the realm of dreams. When I have a house, as I sometime may, I'll suit my fancy in every way. I'll fill it with things that have caught my eye and drifting from Iceland to Molokai. Oh, it won't be correct or in period style. But oh, I've thought for a long, long while of all the corners and all the nooks of all the bookshelves and all the books, the great big sofa, the deep soft chairs, the Chinese rug at the foot of the stairs. It's an old, old rug from far Chow Wan that a Chinese princess once walked on. My house will stand on the side of a hill by a slow, broad river, deep and still, with a tall, lone pine on guard nearby where the birds can sing and the storm winds cry. A flagstone walk with lazy curves will lead to the door where a, fan, a, a, a pan's head serves as a knocker, there like a vibrant drum to let me know that a friend has come. And the door will squeak as I swing it wide to welcome you to the cheer inside. For I'll have good friends who can sit and chat or simply sit when it comes to that by the fireplace. For the fur logs blaze and the smoke rolls up in a weaving haze. I'll have a wood box scarred and rough for roots and bark and odorous stuff like <coughs> resinous knots and cones and gums to check on the flames when winter comes. And I hope a cricket will stay around, for I love its creaky, lonesome sound. There'll be driftwood powder to burn on logs, and a shaggy rug for a couple of dogs. Boris, winner of prize and cup, and Mickey, a lovable gutter pup. Thoroughbreds, both of them, right from the start, one by breeding, the other by heart. There are times when only a dog will do for a friend, when you're beaten, sick and blue, and the world's all wrong. For he won't care if you break and cry or grouch and swear. And he'll let you know as he licks your hand that he's downright sorry and understand. I'll have on a bench a box inlaid with dragon plaques of milk-white jade to hold my own particular brand of cigarettes brought from the Pharaoh's land, with a coisonne bowl on a lizard skin to flick my cigarette ashes in, and a squat blue jar for a certain blend of pipe tobacco. I'll have to send to a quaint old chap I chanced to meet in his fusty shop on a London street. A long, low shelf of teak will hold my best loved books in leather and gold while magazines lie on a bow-legged stand in a polyglot mixture goes at hand. I'll have on a table a rich brocade that I think the pixies must have made, for the dull gold thread on blues and grays weaves the pattern of puck, the magic maze. On the mantelpiece, there will be a place for a little mud god with a painted <coughs> face that was given to me all long ago by a Philippine maid in Olongopo. Then just within range of a lazy reach, a bulging bowl of Indian beach will brim with things that are good to munch, hickory nuts to crack and crunch, big fat raisins, sun-dried dates, curious fruits from the Malay Straits, maple sugar with cookies, brown and good hard cider to wash them down. Wine sap apples, the pick of the crop. Ears of corn to shell and pop, a plenty of butter and lots of salt. If you don't get filled, it's not my fault. And there where the shadows fall, I plan to have a magnificent concert grant <coughs> with polished wood and ivory keys for wild discordant rhapsodies, for wailing minor Hindu songs, for Chinese chants, with clanging gongs for flippant jazz and for lullabies. Moody things that I'll improvise to play the long gray dusk away and bid goodbye to another day. 
pictures. I think I'll have but three. One in oil of a windswept sea with the flying scud and the waves swift white. I know the chap who can paint it right in lapis blue and deep jade green. A great big smashing fine marine that'll make you feel a spray in your face. I'll hang it over the fireplace. The second picture, a freakish thing, as gaudy and bright as a macaw's wing, an impressionistic smear called sin, a nude on a striped zebra skin by a Danish girl I knew in France. My respectable friends will look askance at the purple eyes and the scarlet air, at the pallid look and the evil stare of that sinister, beautiful vampire face. I shouldn't have it about the place. Yet I like while I loathe the beastly thing. That's the way one feels about sin. Picture I love the best of all will hang alone on my study wall where the sunsets glow and the moon's cold gleam will fall on the face and make it seem that the eyes in the picture are meeting mine, that the lips are drawn in the fine, sweet line of that wistful, tender, provocative smile that has stirred my heart for a wondrous while. It's a sketch of the girl who loved too well to tie me down to that bit of hell that the drifter knows when he finds he's held by the soft, strong chains of passion's wealth. It was best for her and for me, I know, that she measured my love and bade me go. For we still have our great illusion yet, unsoiled, unspoiled by a vain regret. Oh, I won't deny that it makes me sad to think that I've missed what I might have had. It's a clean, sweet memory, quite apart, and I've been faithful in my heart. All of these things will I have about. Not a one could I do without cedar and sandalwood chips to burn in the tarnished bowl of a copper urn, a paperweight of meteorite that seared and scorched the sky one night, a moral crease my paper knife once slit the throat of a rose's wife and the beams of my house will be fragrant wood that once in a teeming jungle stood as a proud tall tree where the leopard couched and the parrot screamed and the black men crouched. The roof must have a rakish dip to shadowy eaves where the rain can drip in a damp, persistent, tuneful way. It's a cheerful sound on a gloomy day. And I Hope a couple of birds will nest about the house. I'll do my best to make them happy so every year they'll raise their brood of fledgling care. Pewter, bronze, hammered brass, old carved wood, gleaming glass, candles in polychrome candlesticks, peasant lamps with floating wicks, dragons in silk on a mandarin suit in a chest that is filled with Vagabonds, loot, all of those beautiful, useless things that a vagabond's aimless drifting brings. And then, when my house is all complete, I'll stretch me out on the window seat with a favorite book, a cigarette, a long, cool drink that old joy will get. And I'll look about at my bachelor nest while the sun goes zooming down the west and the hot gold light will fall on my face and make me think of some heathen place that I fail to see that I miss some way, a place that I plan to see someday. And I'll feel the lure of it drawing me. Oh, damn, I know what the end will be. I'll go and my house will fall away while the mice by nights and the moths by day will nibble the covers off all my books and the shadows weave in, in, in the shadowed nooks and my dogs. I'll see that they have a home while I follow the sun, while I drift and roam to the ends of the earth like a chip on the stream, like a straw on the wind, like 
a vagrant dream. And the thought will strike with a swift, sharp pain that I probably never will build again this house that I'll have in some far day. Well, it's only a dream house anyway. Thank you very much. Given us and the effort you have made, but we would like to present a little gift. Well, thank you very much. Oh, that's too long. You spoil him. I gotta live with that. <laughs> <laughs> now we have a few announcements to make, Evan. I think you have a little.